More step-by-step -step diplomacy performed outside the United Nations Security Council. We don't know if U.S. diplomats and ambassadors are warned, don't walk under that overseas ladder when they are given their marching orders. But we do know that a recent report says the diplomats could use a lot of other advice. A panel commissioned by the Bush administration says U.S. envoys could keep in better touch with the citizens of the country they cable back from. Ambassadors no longer are just reporters. Those days are gone. Most of the decisions in the world now depend on public opinion. So you've got to communicate, you've got to communicate with the people, not just government officials. Joining us now is the executive director of the group that wrote this report. His name is Matt Lauer. He's in Washington. And also with us here in New York, Nicholas Platt, a 34-year diplomat. He was ambassador to the Philippines, Pakistan, and Zambia. Ambassador Platt more recently served as president of the Asia Society, an organization dedicated to mutual understanding between the United States and Asia. All right, Matt Lauer. Uh, what is the main conclusion of this report regarding the work of ambassadors overseas? What's, what's being done incorrectly? Well, really what we're saying is it's not just ambassadors, but it's the entire foreign service. It's, it's all of the Americans abroad. We need to do a much better job of communicating American foreign policy to the people at the, at the, that are actually in country at the, the local level. So we're saying that 25% of the time that ambassadors and foreign service officers, uh, that uh, the time that they spend out there needs to be with people communicating American ideals and American concepts, explaining ourselves, essentially. Do they even speak the language? Uh, well, we, we hope that many of them do, and we're getting better. Uh, the State Department's getting better at training ambassadors and, uh, and foreign service officers to speak the language, but that's one of the key recommendations of our report that everyone needs to have the skills, the language training necessary in those countries to, right. uh, to actually communicate Let's with Let's get the insight of somebody who's been overseas representing the U.S., and this was a U.S.-driven report, so that's why we're dealing with U.S. diplomacy, uh, Ambassador Platt. Well, I read the report with great interest, and uh, I thought I was Rip Van Winkle, and I'd just woken up, you know, 24 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, we all got training. Uh, we got training in public diplomacy. We got training in, in how to deal with uh, media issues. Uh, we were not told that we should depart from State Department uh, policy uh, in our media appearances, but we were given training as to how to deal with those kinds of situations. I read the report. I found that going through it in a very systematic way, what was most, uh, the point that came out clearest was you've got to put a lot more money into public diplomacy, and that is a very sound a very sound proposal because we used to during the Cold War put a lot of money into public diplomacy. But uh, go ahead, Th Matt. Yeah, that's right. Resources are a part of the issue. Um, and during during the old days, during the Cold War, we did train our ambassadors and foreign service officers a great deal in public diplomacy. We need to go back to the the era of of, of actively engaging citizens abroad. It was a little bit different uh, during the the Cold War, but uh, we need to engage people in the the global communication well, cycle. And that's what we're saying. You're absolutely right. You're yeah. absolutely right. And, and, I would, uh, and things have changed. You know, after the Cold War ended, ambassadors were given a lot of training in representing mm -hmm. business interests abroad. That was what the emphasis was then. Now we have some new emphasis, and we have, mm -hmm. to, we have to deal with that. But the money, you're talking about all the money now goes to securing the ambassadors in a bunker because of 9-11 and everything. How are you going to get out, um, let's address this to the man behind the report, how are you going to get these people out when they're protected uh, in many countries the country uh, residents hate it because it's a giant fortress where the U.S. Well, is. It's a valid question. What we have to do is, is joining the Foreign Service, being an ambassador, there's a, a certain risk to, uh, to, to undertaking that duty, just like the president takes a risk when, when he goes out to, to, to a rally, to, uh, to a town hall meeting. Uh, a senator takes a risk and a congressman. And so there, there's a, a necessary risk that's going to take, but people need to get out, more of the, uh, to get out of the ambassador. embassy more and more. You have to realize that the first thing that is done officially after you get your papers uh, appointing you as an ambassador is you're measured for a bulletproof vest. <laughs> and uh, then, and you realize that this is a dangerous job. Now, I was ambassador in the Philippines, which was a very public job. And uh, I was considered a sort of a political figure, so I had to make a lot of speeches. I had to get out and around. Uh, I had a lot of protection. I had a car that went ahead, a car that went behind, had nine guys with Uzis, Uzis in their, their briefcases and so on and so forth. But we made our speeches, we made our points, we got on the TV and so on and so forth. Other ambassadorial jobs are not so public. 
nor are they so dangerous. Now, you said, Matt, earlier about 25 percent, uh, you're saying, uh, of, the, the, of the time for ambassadors should be spent with the public. Uh, yeah, it, that's, go ahead. That's right. We are saying that not just ambassadors as well. We're saying all Americans abroad that are employed by the government, 25 percent of their time should be spent out engaged with the community, whether that's all the, all the way down from the Marine but, Guard at the embassy, all the way up to the ambassador. But what happens when the U.S., as it currently stands, due to various policies that many like, many object to, but overseas, they're detested. Uh, how do, It's easy in a report to write that, but it's such a yeah. volatile climate now. We do. Uh, we, have a, we have a policy now that we maintain for our national security purposes. But part of our job, part of our job going out abroad is to communicate with people. So we undertake those risks. We have to explain it to people. We have to engage them. A lot of what we hear coming from abroad is that we just don't listen enough. But we aren't these people so scared? I mean, how are you, Nicholas, aren't these ambassadors and representatives, they're not going to, how are they going to go out on a limb at a town hall meeting and suddenly answer questions when they're petrified, right, that back at the State Department or Washington they're going to get slapped around? Well, it can be done. And, uh, uh, but it takes a lot of doing and it takes a lot of courage. I mean, I have one of my friends, is, uh, our ambassador in Indonesia, who uh, really made an important point when he right. went out and debated mm -hmm. Islamic, uh, is, Islamic leaders. Uh, he had had a background in the Middle East and, and, uh, and he understood what he was saying and they, they all admired him for it. They were not. They, they, they didn't agree, but at least he got out onto the hustings. What we're talking is about is a, more of an American dialogue out there. Policy positions up to the embassy, but more American communication with, uh, with people in the Arab and Muslim world and in the European audiences. It's all, it's all very relevant, and we're just not doing a great job you, of and your uh, report says, right now. And your report says, uh, watch your wording. It says uh, U.S. officials often describe terrorists by words that terrorists themselves prefer, like jihad and mujahideen. Uh, these imply martyrdom, things like that. Well, that's right. I mean, we, we see that uh, often these, uh, these, these words are reflected in the, the era media or in other medias abroad. You know, when uh, Ronald Reagan was president, he referred to the, the Soviet Union as the evil empire. So it was properly reflected in the, the media of the era. We need to properly refer to these, um, our enemies as, as the what Russians, they are, evildoers. The Soviets didn't like it. We liked <laughs> it. And, yeah. But we didn't care that the Soviets didn't like it. So what is a fine line, Ambassador Platt, you've got President Bush has said you're either with us or against us. How, you know, these audiences, I've been in them, you know the number one question in many countries it's going to be, when will the U.S. stop helping Israel, whatever your opinion on that is. I mean, well, how do you cut through that? You, you, you have to be able to defend your policies, and if the policies are flawed, you're going to have trouble with that. Uh, the job of ambassadors abroad and diplomats abroad is to defend mm -hmm. the policy. If the policy is flawed, it's harder to do. Ambassador, uh, the ambassador is absolutely right. What we need to do is have people out there defending our policy. The, the policy in this country it comes about through democratic means. We need to explain that. Um, it, 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 this is not a made-up policy that, that came forth from a, a non-elected uh, uh, a group of representatives. This is a, a democratically based policy and we need to communicate in how it came about, explaining a little bit about our system. Of course, our society isn't monolithic, but we do have ways you of explaining how that. You can't get so. out, though. I mean, in, when yeah. I was in Islamabad uh, recently, I mean, it wasn't when I was actually ambassador. It was a different kind of time, but there are a lot of new uh, TV, um, mm -hmm. new t t TV uh, systems uh, and, and channels and so forth. One yeah. of them was Al Arabia, which has carried a lot mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of material that is very critical of the United States, can but they listen to us. Can TV help, or does it, is it overwhelming? The Al Jazeera, the Al Arabi, whatever, all of the broadcasts well, can what? kind of overwhelm a media message, Nicholas? It, 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 you, you, can, you can use them. You can get yeah. on them. You can make your, make your views known. Final and comment, you, Matt, very briefly. What all these television stations and all the Internet is doing is, is leaving the, the... People can make up their own minds now, so we have to engage people face-to-face, -face, not just foreign minister to foreign minister, ambassador to ambassador, and that's what we're going to do right, um, we, if we're going to we, have an effective communication you policy. Just, you can't just ask anybody to go on the media without some training. It's that's right. It's complicated. Okay. It's difficult. When you have to deal with people like Richard here, you've got to be on your toes, you've got to speak fast. And Invite this man back. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, listen, I'm not a resident at the moment of uh, living overseas, but Nicholas yes. Platt, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the former president of the Asia Society and ambassador to several countries, including Pakistan, uh, where uh, Matt Lauer's uh, report may have some uh, interesting impact. He is the executive director of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. Pakistan certainly a country that would uh, figure prominently in some of these proposals. Thank you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Um